everyone, welcome to Groundswell Online. My name is Taylor. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. Merry Christmas to you. Christmas is fast approaching, as I'm sure you know. I hope you've gotten your Christmas shopping halfway done, maybe at least. Um, we just wanna say a huge thank you to everyone who has donated um, for our initiative to support families this Christmas who are in need. Thank you so much if you've donated. Um, really appreciate that and um, have just been moved myself at seeing our community come together to support people um, this Christmas season. So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for being um, sacrificial with what you have. Um, as we look ahead to Christmas Eve here at Ground Soil, um, we are having three services this year. So one is at 11 a.m. in East Hans. So Maple Ridge Elementary School, 11 a.m. on Christmas Eve. Then in the evening, we're gonna be here in Truro at our 759 Prince Street location at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So two opportunities there for you to come in Truro. This service is very much going to be, first of all, it's the same at all three, and then it's very much um, targeted for a family. So kids will, are welcome in the service. We're gonna have specific elements within the service just for the kids to keep them engaged, keep them having fun along with everybody. We are just really excited to celebrate, to reflect on this Christmas season, to reflect on this Christmas story, why we worship, why we sing who Jesus is and what he did, how he came down. And we're, we're so excited to, to dive into that more together on Christmas Eve. I think it's gonna be so special and such a great um, memory uh, and tradition. If that's not something you're used to, highly recommend that you come, you are invited. We would love if you would join us for Christmas Eve this year. So thank you for tuning in. I'm gonna pray for us as we head in to today's message. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for every person who is tuning in right now Holy Spirit, I pray that you would meet each person wherever they are, at home, um, you know, on the go. Would you meet them? Would you open our eyes to see Jesus today, to get to know Jesus and to be changed by him today? Thank you, Lord, that you have come, that you are Emmanuel, which means God with us. Thank you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We are only two weeks out from Christmas and the excitement is building, maybe some of the stress too. There's lots of parties, celebrations. On the weekend, we hosted uh, 250 people for this great family Christmas event. Who knows, maybe it'll become a tradition, but this is the time of year that we pull out all the stops, right? We pull out all the traditions, even the cheesy ones. And one of my favorite traditions around Christmas is just music. I'm sure many of you have favorite Christmas songs like Silent Night or I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. There's all kinds of great Christmas songs that we love. One of my favorite Christmas albums to this day is Kenny and Dolly's Christmas. Now, it, like, it drives my kids crazy, but I'm sure there are some of you out there that it's very nostalgic, right? Christmas songs, they stir up memories for us of, of ways that that, like things that have happened to us during Christmas past. Now, every year I love the old songs, but I also love to look for a new song. And I look for a song that maybe, you know, could be my new favorite song for the year. And this year it's Phil Wickham's song called Manger Throne. Now, manger and throne don't really sound like two words that should be put together because a manger is, well, it's for animals to eat out of. It's not the cleanest, likely found in a barn with all kinds of other smelly animals. Where a throne, on the other hand, is it conjures up visions of grandeur and importance and royalty or maybe even power. And yet, when we look at the birth of Jesus, manger throne is actually a pretty accurate description. The symbolism of Jesus reigning from a manger is profound, and it really messes with traditional ideas of kingship and authority. Traditionally, kings are figures of power and prestige. They're draped in fancy robes, seated on imposing thrones, and ruling from grand palaces. 
Now, I don't really follow the royal family all that much, but this past year, we just, my family happened to be in London during the coronation. Now, we didn't go for the coronation. We went because I had a conference and then my family joined me later, but it was kind of neat to be there at the time. It was pretty crazy. Like people were lined up for days along the mall. So it's a road that goes towards the palace, like just to get a glimpse of the king or the, or of the carriage or whatever just like as it rode by. And we, in our minds, when we think about royalty, maybe we conjure up pictures like well, this picture of King Charles, all in this fancy robe and his crown holding his scepters. Like that's kind of pictures that we get in our mind. Or maybe we imagine this processional. The processional was unbelievable. This gold carriage with military and marching bands. Like we just even happened to be there ahead of time. We got to see all these, these, the, the horsemen practicing and the, then the marching bands practicing. Like it was a big deal, but like me, I know Charles isn't your favorite. So maybe you'd prefer a little Will and Kate. Most people like them. And maybe our modern day monarchs don't make you think of power and prestige, but human history is filled with rulers who commanded armies, who wielded power and wealth, and whose authority was often unchallenged. This is the expectation, the conventional image of a king. And whether we like it or not, it's kind of ingrained in our minds through centuries of tradition and history and, and even some movies that kind of embed that in our, in our thinking. But then we encounter Jesus. King Jesus doesn't arrive amidst fanfare and royal procession. He's born in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. No palace walls like protect him. No, he doesn't wear any luxurious robes. There's no army standing to salute him. This is not what you would expect from a king, but it is how this king arrived. It is a reality that turns our understanding of kingship, power, and authority completely upside down. Now, last week, we began our journey towards Christmas with Mary, an unexpected choice to carry the Savior into the world. So let's pick up on her story as she journeys towards Bethlehem. Luke 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for, of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Caesar Augustus is the reigning Roman emperor when Jesus is born. Now Augustus, he was known for transforming Rome from a city of clay to a city of marble. He was a man of great ambition, but also he was pretty politically savvy. And it was his idea to get everyone in the known Roman world accounted for, like on a list, so he could tax them. And his census began this chain of events that forced Mary and Joseph to leave their home in Nazareth and travel to Bethlehem because everyone had to go back to their, home, their own hometown for this census. Now, Bethlehem is known as the city of David, and this is where Jesus would be born. This would be the birthplace of Jesus. And so that's where we pick up the story, how we, we're following along with the story of Mary and Joseph and into the birth of Jesus. Now, the New Testament writer, so the New Testament is the smaller section of the Bible. Towards the end, it chronicles Jesus' life and the life of his disciples. <coughs> Excuse me. And the New Testament writer, Paul, he comments on this time when Jesus enters the story of the Bible. And he says this, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So talking about the Roman law to redeem those under the law, 
that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, what you may not know just by reading this um, scripture is that that phrase adoption to sonship, the, the Greek words that are translated to the adoption to, sh- to sonship is a legal term actually referring to the full legal standing of an adopted male heir in a Roman culture. So there's this sense of being brought into royalty that Paul is talking about, like about Jesus' arrival, that people would be adopted into royalty. So it's kind of like an interesting little tidbit there. So at this time in history, the Israelites, they live scattered in Israel and throughout the Middle East. and But they're under the thumb of the Romans. And they are still waiting for their promised Messiah because the prophets from the Old Testament, they had promised this Messiah, a ruler who would renew their kingdom and lead them out from under the oppression of Rome. So you can fully understand really why they expected a king with a powerful army, a a political strength. They were looking for a conqueror, a long-awaited king who could crush their enemy and set them free. So why does God choose to reveal his sovereignty, his authority in such a humble, unassuming way? I think it has a lot to tell us about the nature of the king and his kingdom. So let's look at a few principles today about the king and his kingdom. So under King Jesus, worldly values are reversed. So Jesus' humble arrival, it really flips worldly values upside down. Because in God's kingdom, greatness isn't measured with wealth, power, or status. It's measured by humility and service and love. And this is definitely not how we would understand success and power in our world. We, when we think of successful people, we think of people who are rich or famous or have political influence or maybe, you know, invented AI. But God's economy, it doesn't work that way. When speaking about the kingdom of God, Jesus said, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. In God's kingdom, God's kingdom values accessibility and inclusivity. The humility of Jesus' birth symbolizes the accessibility and inclusivity of God's kingdom. Jesus was placed in a manger, an ordinary and easily accessible place. It wasn't like a palace that has gates and is locked down or is exclusive and, and most regular people can never access. A manger is a place anyone could approach. God's kingdom is open to everyone, regardless of social status or wealth or background, regardless of what you've done or where you've been, or there's just this open invitation into his kingdom. In God's kingdom, there is an emphasis on spiritual values. The humble circumstances of Jesus' arrival really emphasizes that God's kingdom is founded on the spiritual rather than material values. Qualities like faith and hope, love, compassion, and justice are valued over worldly achievements and possessions. The the true essence of the kingdom isn't found in external displays of power, but the transformation of hearts and lives. Jesus is a king who values service and sacrificial love. He's a humble king, and he embodies the the principle of servant leadership. His life and his teachings, they demonstrate that leadership, that leadership in God's kingdom is, it's actually about serving others, not about lording over them. We see it in Jesus' own life as he serves and heals and listens and teaches and ultimately sacrifices himself for humanity. In God's kingdom, there is a rejection of domination and coercion. The humble arrival of Jesus, it reflects a rejection of the use of force and domination and coercion, which is so common in earthly kingdoms. We see it happening in our world right now. We we may not have kings who who rule, but we certainly have political 
political powers attempting to dominate through brutal military force. But God's kingdom advances with love and generosity and self-sacrifice. It's a stark contrast to how we often see human empires expand and maintain control. God's kingdom is a place of peace and reconciliation. The nature of Jesus' kingship and the values of his kingdom, they point towards peace and reconciliation rather than conflict and division. Jesus promoted forgiveness and reconciliation and the breaking down of barriers between people, which reflects the harmonious and peaceful nature of God's kingdom. God's kingdom operates in transformative power, not brute force, transformative power. Despite its humble appearance, the arrival of Jesus signifies the transformative power of God's kingdom breaking through, breaking in. It has the power to change lives, reform societies, and influence the course of history, not through overwhelming force, but through the quiet power of truth and love. God's kingdom, it operates on an eternal perspective. The humble beginnings of Jesus remind us that God's kingdom, it operates on an eternal perspective with the eternal focus. It, it values what is lasting and spiritual over what is temporary and material. It's focused on eternal realities rather than immediate gratification or what we can get or have here on this earth. So let me ask you a question today. When you hear about this king and his kingdom, is this the kind of king you're looking for? You know, I think a lot of us are okay with calling Jesus our savior, recognizing and, and believing that he died to save us from our sin. Like we're good with being saved. We're good with that. But we struggle to call him king, to invite him to be Lord of our life, to trust him to lead us. And, and maybe that's because you know, we question his existence. Maybe you're a skeptic and you wonder. Maybe it's because we see him as maybe a, a, that kind of king who might lord over us. Or maybe it's because we just like to be king of our own life. Jesus did not come into a world looking for a lord and savior. He came into a world where Caesar Augustus was proclaimed to be Lord and Savior for bringing peace to the Roman Empire by defeating his rivals, squashing rebellions with a heavy hand and continually conquering barbarian lands. Jesus did not come into a world looking for a king of the Jews. Jesus came into a world where Herod had already been given that title, king of the Jews and by Augustus Caesar, no less. And Herod was more than willing to lie, cheat, steal, and kill to keep that title. Herod was so intent on making his greatness known that he forced slaves to build him a man-made mountain in Jerusalem where he could build an opulent palace. So whenever people would look up, they would see his palace and be reminded of his power. That's the world Jesus came into. Now, it's pretty common in our day for, for people to question God, God's existence in the face of political scandals and war and heartbreaking inequality. Like, it just seems unbelievable. Yet... It was into a world with even more scandal and inequality that Jesus was actually born. He came to show us the true nature of power. And, and he chose not to rule from a golden throne in Rome or a, a lavish palace in Jerusalem. He chose a manger as his first throne. The king of creation who came back to save his people, showed us the nature of true power, not to slaughter our enemies, but to love them, not to conquer foreign lands, but to conquer our rebellious hearts, not to force us to worship him with the sword, 
but to bring us to our knees by the power of his sacrifice for us on the cross. Today, the Roman Empire is ancient history and Herod is considered a paranoid failure. The billions of people still worship the one whose first throne was a manger. If you want to see great power, you don't need to look to politicians or mighty conquerors. Go look at the manger and then shift your gaze to the cross. Because if you're looking to find power, true power that transforms lives, that that changes things, the manger is where you'll find it. So as we navigate through this Christmas season together, as we, we head towards celebrating the birth of Jesus, I think the question we all have to answer for ourselves is, is this the kind of king we're looking for? Are we trying to reign and rule over our own lives? Do we think that we know better than the king? Are we afraid? Do, are we fearful that he's just going to force us to do things that we don't want to do? Do we not really have a proper understanding of who King Jesus really is? Because King Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, not to lord over. And when we know deep down, when we truly understand the power of that, the true power that, that Jesus, King Jesus brings, I, I think it just, it, it humbles us. And so as you navigate the next number of weeks towards Christmas, I want to encourage you to wrestle with the question, is this the kind of king I'm looking for? Because King Jesus has created an accessible place where you can come and meet him, where you can come and be led by him, where you can put your trust in him and follow the true king. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are so thankful today that uh, you are a loving, gracious, and kind king, that you rule with truth and love, that you are an accessible and inclusive God who invites everyone into your kingdom, that you don't rule with force, but you rule with self-sacrifice, that you value self-sacrifice. And Lord, we are so thankful today that you gave yourself for us. And Lord, I pray for everyone who is watching that in these next few weeks, we would wrestle with the question, are you the king we're looking for? Do we, do we have a misunderstanding of who you are? Lord, I pray that today um, would, be the, would be step one in unraveling some of that for us, in, in us truly seeking, really seeking after the one true king, and that our hearts and lives would be transformed because of the work of your spirit in us. And so, Lord, we love you. And we worship you today, King Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.